Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this session. And uh, for the guys that are sit down on the back of the room, if, if is that okay for you? May I ask you to come closer? We would like to make this session as interactive as possible. Okay? There is one guy in the back. Are you able to move forward if you want? Are you okay? I mean... Yeah, just, just come closer. Is. Just come closer if you want. Okay? Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for coming. So who we are? So our name is Gary Forge. We are a company that is focused on uh, Garrett, and here we are going to show you how you can use code review, continuous integration, continuous delivery in a kind of scenario that is not very common for this type of practices, that is a, a large-scale big data project. So in terms of what we do, we basically do open source. So we are one of those companies who are paid by our clients not to write proprietary code, but to write open source and to fuel innovation in open source projects. And specifically here, we are coming, let's say, on behalf of the technologies that are known as big data. So let's start with a quick poll, because we need to understand exactly from which background you're coming from. So how many of you guys are working in a big data project? Can you raise your hand, please? OK, so just three, four. For all the others, what are you doing here? <laughs> but it's fine. So all the concepts we are going to describe, we are going to show how we implement it in a big data project, but they are absolutely valid for other scenarios as well, right? So first of all, who we are, the team. So me, my name is Luca. I don't live on the second floor. I live on the first floor. Uh, just joking. And uh, I, I am the co-founder of Gary Forge. The company was founded six years ago. We moved to London, and we enjoy the city. Then there is Antonius that is not with us, but he's sitting over there because he's a bit shy. Where is Antonius? Raise your hand. There we go. He's Greek, and he's a fan of big data, and he's writing the new big thing that is called landoop.com. So have a look on that. It's going to be a very interesting project on big data. we go got Tiago. There we go. Uh, yes. So mainly doing working on the data warehousing and big data development. Um, also did uh, quite a lot of data modeling, um, and now um, lately very much on big data infrastructure, setting up okay. a Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, step along. Yeah. There we go. So <laughs> let's conclude the presentation and let's go to the, the content. Yeah, mostly working on software development. I'm recently moving on big data projects and uh, on big data infrastructure settings in uh, open source uh, and uh, yeah, focusing on uh, the so, process. It's a bit shy. He is the father of TDD for Scaldi. So he invented the concept of test-driven development in Scaldi. It's a very popular DSL-based language for uh, Hadoop applications. So it's really, let's say, a very big open source contributor. OK, so the agenda. First of all, <laughs> so why we crazy guys decided to do some continuous deployment on big data? Why is the rest of the world, they were not doing it, or they were not doing continuous integration on big data projects? They were just using online consoles. And then you are going to see exactly what are the basic concepts that we introduced and how we mix them together to make the things work. And uh, it's not going to be a bunch of slides, so I'm going to be silent very soon because I will just give the control to Stefano. They will show you exactly how we did it because we recreated a small scale environment, but a live environment that is really similar to the ones that we created for large clients. So first of all, why? So what we've seen when we started working in big data projects with large clients, we've seen that most of the people, they were just starting writing code straight away and just creating Hadoop jobs or maybe MapReduce jobs or maybe Spark jobs straight away and just checking end-to-end -end when the system is deployed if the things make sense or not. And we were saying, come on, this makes sense, but the flow is too long. So the latency is too long. And when you get feedback, maybe it's too late from when we really need it. So we say, why can't we use the best practice that we use in other scenarios? Why don't we apply it to big data as well? Because it will definitely make sense. And we say, why don't we introduce code reviews? So in, in the keynote this morning, the guy from Accenture made a very interesting point. That is, we would like to have every commit to be a candidate to go to production. But in order to be a candidate to go to production, you need to be sure that it is 
absolutely working, unit tests, integration tests, they make sense. So in that case, how can we integrate that in a short cycle loop? Okay, so first of all, we concentrated on the code. We said, okay, we were using Git, we said Git is not enough. We need something that is able, first of all, to make sure that whatever we do is stable. So we adopted a stable branch scenario. How many of you have heard about the stable branch approach? Good, good. And the reason was very simple. The team was large. There was a team in the UK, a team in Israel, a team in India. And what is the impact of a broken build? If I'm breaking the build at 5 o'clock in London, I will break people working in India tomorrow morning because they will try to push their stuff. It wouldn't work. And the people in Israel as well, until I wake up and it will be lunchtime for the guys in Israel, they'll say, oh my god, I broke the build yesterday, I'm going to fix it. Yes, but maybe you block 25 people for one day, you've lost already 25 man days. That is a lot of money and it's a lot of delay in terms of latency. And then we said, okay, can we just automate everything with basically the glue that makes the continuous delivery work that is Jenkins? And that's why we present in a Jenkins conference. So, I'm not going to describe all the flow because this is, this is not a talk about code review, but this is the flow that you use in code review. So, and uh, Stephanie is going to show this in practice. So basically, you take your code, you create a change, you push for review, but when you push, it's not on the branch yet. It's in a kind of limbo. And in this limbo, can get verified. We'll show as well how to do integration test pre-commit. That it sounds crazy, but we do it and it works. And when all those rules are satisfied and I'm making sure that I'm not breaking stuff in production, then I can go emerge it. The last part is really interesting. That is a new concept that is coming on Gerrits. Many times when you do a single commit, yes, the single commit needs to be really, really stable. But sometimes you want to define a set of commits that make sense together. So we introduced the concept of a topic, a concept that exists already in Garrett, right? But it was not used in this scenario. So recently, the guys, they introduced the concept of atomic commit, and we started using by putting stable commits together in package and submit that together as a unique entity. And we are going to show as well how we made this working with the integration with Jenkins. Thanks to this guy that is sit over there, Robin Sandel. That is the author of the Jenkins Automation Gary Trigger plugin. So thanks to this guy, basically our demo is possible. Otherwise, we we're just talking about, let's say, I don't know, the news or the weather. That's quite common in the UK. Everyone is talking about the weather. OK, so the first guy that we use is this bird. That is the logo of Garrett, Garrett Code Review. How many people in the room are already using Garrett Code Review? Good. For the others, just go online, go to YouTube. There are lots of videos. Watch a video because this tool is really, really, really amazing. Maybe the GUI is not nice, but this is really the tool that allowed us to make things work. And we integrated the commit and integration flex validation onto that. And then there is Jenkins. I don't have to talk about Jenkins because you know better than me. And we use the Gary Trigger, the PostBuild plugin, and Docker. And there will be a lot of Docker in this talk as well. Now I'm leaving to Tiago. Then I'm just going to explain, let's say, the big data part. So um, for those that are new to big data, most of our development is done uh, developing ATL jobs. So that means uh, um, we're writing uh, codes to extract data from one system, doing some transformation, and then bring it to Hadoop in our case. We were using quite a lot um, scalding, development in scalding. Uh, scalding is a uh, kind of an abstraction of MapReduce uh, on Hadoop, um, and Spark development, very uh, intensive Spark development lately. Um, so to, to do the integration test uh, with uh, this, the big data tools such as Hadoop, we need to kind of uh, create an environment where, uh, uh, isolated environment where pe people can run their, their applications. So. Um, Running your application in standalone modes, uh, for example, in Hadoop or local modes, uh, doesn't uh, test. I mean, it tests the software that functionally works, but doesn't test for, for everything. So 
uh, we need to test uh, that uh, the, the classes uh, serialization. We need to validate that the fat jars that you create they are not incompatible when you submit the, the job in the in cluster mode. So uh, the way uh, we approached this was using um, Docker uh, and uh, Mesos and Marathon with Jenkins, of course. Um, so we had a set of physical machines available, and we wanted to take as much as possible, uh, the, take advantage of the resources available to us. So uh, I'll be explaining more in detail how we were doing this. So we wanted to test in a real uh, cluster, ephemeral cl cluster that would just be uh, spinned up. Uh, you, you run your, your tests, your, your integration test, and then you, you kill that, uh, that Hadoop cluster uh, or uh, Spark, uh, Spark, Spark cluster. So, um, so the, the solution, as I was, as, as, as mentioning, we, we had Mesos that uh, kind of had an overview of the CPU and memory available on the, this, uh, we had the 12 machines. Um, and basically what uh, Jenkins was doing uh, was um, starting uh, via Marathon uh, a full uh, Hadoop cluster and then submitting the, the ETL job uh, the ETL job would then extract data from, from an, uh, an Oracle database, for example, and then do some transformation, load it into Hadoop, and then there would be some integration tests that would check that the data is consistent. Um, so just moving. So j just for those that are new for, uh, to Mesos and Marathon, I don't think many of you probably, many of you already heard about these tools. So Mesos kind of uh, abstracts the CPU and memory of your physical machine, so it takes care, it, it tells you how much uh, CPU and memory you have available in your uh, set, uh, cluster uh, or in your cloud. And then you have Marathon, which is a framework that uh, runs on top of Mesos and registers, registers to uh, Mesos and receives uh, resource offers. Marathon then make, make so, makes sure, guarantees that the services that are run through Marathon, they keep on running, they don't, they don't, don't, don't just die. And for example, if you have a, a Docker container uh, that is killed for some reason, Marathon will guarantee that the, the, the Docker container will run on, on a different uh, physical machine. So how, how were we doing this? Uh, how were we uh, spinning up the Hadoop cluster? Um, we, we were using mainly a Cloudera distribution of Hadoop. Uh, the Cloudera distribution that we are using also for this demo is uh, CDH 5.4. Uh, 5, 5 um, the reason we're using Cloudera 5.4 is because uh, in Spark, for, for this demo, we're using a feature called Data Frames from Spark. Um, and so we'll, we'll be mainly, mainly using uh, Spark, HDFS, and Yarn. So this is uh, pretty much the flow that we had um, for doing our integration. So we had Jenkins. Um, posting into Marathon um, a JSON saying, uh, spin, spin me up a uh, Cloudera Manager uh, Docker container and n number of Cloudera agents. Uh, so you'd have n number of Docker containers running Cloudera agent. And then uh, Marathon would follow the, the normal process of submitting these Docker containers via Mesos. Uh, and uh, these, these Docker containers would run on different physical machines. Then you'd, uh, Jenkins would wait until the, 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 the Dockers would be up, and once the, the, the Cloudera manager would be up, we're using Python scripts uh, via the, the Cloudera API, we would do the full deployments, or if we were just using, for example, uh, HDFS, we would just deploy HDFS on the cluster, but all the deployment of the Hadoop cluster, we would be doing it via the REST API of Cloudera, Cloudera management. Once the Hadoop was uh, set up, we would deploy the ETL, run the ETL, and then run some integration tests to check that the data was consistent. And um, then we would just simply kill those, uh, those, those, those Docker containers. Um, so Marathon and Mesos helped us quite a lot to understand what are the machines that are free and I can spin up a new Docker so I can run multiple Hadoop clusters uh, for the, the integration tests. So, yeah, so this is mainly it. Yeah, so, yeah, let's, let's apply this in a sample project. I just want to come back on 
this slide to discuss a bit, just very quickly. So this is mostly what we do on the end-to-end the -end test. So as you see, the flow looks quite long. Also, first, we are describing all the interactions. But this is mostly what we do when we want to recreate a, a real cluster, so a, a big cluster that mostly will encompass a performance test or acceptance test. For what I'm going to show now, that uh, is uh, this simple project in which we are mostly focusing on the integration part, uh, we are going to not have so much interaction on the Mesos. We are going to use the Docker Jenkins plugin that will just create the Jenkins instance for us. So what I'm going to, to show to you, it's a very simple Spark project. Uh, even if you're not really familiar to Spark, uh, that shouldn't really affect the, this demo. Uh, and um, that does quite a common job. Uh, of what one, job that we found ourselves implementing many times, uh, and there's the extraction of data from a um, relational database, and um, doing some uh, computation, some analysis, uh, that in particular in this case is called uh, change data capture, so it's analysis of the delta from uh, this current extraction to the previous one, and uh, the exporting of the, this data in, um, in our case in CSV format uh, in uh, HDFS. Um, this this project is uh, unit tested, and uh, there will be a phase that will validate the unit test. And uh, then uh, the, there is a very simple integration test that runs uh, against the, uh, a very small set of data. Obviously, this is just for our demo. Um, and as I was saying before, uh, we are actually using two uh, Docker images to contain the, uh, the, the dependency or the, the, the physical uh, deployment dependency. This is like a very simple schematization of the kind of uh, uh, architecture I just described. There is uh, your Jenkins uh, <coughs> node that will uh, run the build job on the left side. And uh, Jenkins is uh, asked uh, through the Docker plugin to create uh, the Oracle and the CDH Docker. The CDH Docker contains uh, Hadoop that is running in pseudo-distributed mode, so it's a single it's a cluster um, using a single instance, and Spark that works in a similar fashion, so it's a single instance. Uh, that's enough for a simple integration test. The, the two dockers, the CDH and the Oracle, are connected, so are linked, so we are able to uh, make them talk without having uh, to create any DNS uh, ent entry or to have uh, clashes of addresses. And uh, yeah, we simply sp spend uh, these two uh, Docker, and uh, we start uh, talking with Oracle, initializing the data, and uh, we start uh, our Spark job, and uh, we execute it, uh, and everything will just work, because Hadoop and, uh, it's, uh, and Spark are capable to talk with the Oracle instance, we'll acquire the data and process it. So uh, this is, just keep that in mind, and this is the kind of simple flow we're trying to implement. So I think if we can switch on the, on the laptop, on the back. Hey. Yep. Yeah, thanks. So let's have a bit of a view around what what will be the, the kind of things, tools that we are using. This uh, first page that you're seeing is our Garrett page. This is the kind of view that you have if you're trying to monitor what's, what's happening to your project. So what are the features or the topics that are currently on development? As you can see at the moment, there's nothing happening. But for example, I can show you some kind of test activity we had before. These are the topics that we merged in the past. And you can also see uh, topics that uh, have been abandoned. Uh, you can also notice in some cases, for example, they were failing the integration test. These, uh, these three phases are the validation, so unit test. Here is the integration test. And this one is the code review. So in some cases, we had some of the topics that simply failed the, the validation has been abandoned, and this one was failing the integration has been abandoned. Others that's been abandoned for other reasons that, I mean, for us, they're not important in this demo. So, okay, so let's start creating uh, um, a new topic. Ah, yes, sorry. Just being asked to, just to show you also a bit of the infrastructure we're having, as uh, Tiago was mentioning, we are running our resources uh, uh, using Marathon. Marathon is doing the resource management. At the moment, the resources we are having actually is the, the Garrett box, so the Garrett server, the Jenkins master, actually our build is just using one master, and uh, uh, the, the registry actually is the Docker registry, is where the Docker instances are located and uh, collected during the build. Obviously, we have Jenkins. Uh, I show you the kind of jobs we are having. We created, uh, 
Yeah, we have uh, uh, one uh, job that actually runs the unit test against the submitted features, submitted topics. Uh, then there is the, the the integration test once the unit tests are passing, and uh, and this completes uh, the validation of uh, any topic. Once a topic is actually merged into master, we are producing the RC. So actually, we are running unit test integration test against uh, this uh, particular commit. Uh, we actually we are not deploying anything at the moment because uh, this is just a simple project. But what you will expect uh, in a normal pipeline for a production system is that there is a, a step that uh, deploys on a, on artifactory and uh, potentially also deploys uh, on uh, if you do continuous delivery on your running uh, your, uh, your production or pre-production system. Okay. So if everything is clear so far, I think we can start doing something. And uh, so let's create a topic. And uh, I have the code here. Check out is this simple Spark ETL demo. And uh, I'm going to create uh, a new topic, a simple topic. Yeah, cool. And uh, this is the source of our uh, of our project. Uh, as I was saying. <coughs> in some simple Scala code that does some Spark transformation. I'm going to change a very useless, uh, I'm going to do a very useless change just to trigger a build. So very simple change. Okay. That, yeah, just I want to be sure that I'm not doing anything controversial. Yeah, but I, I'm expecting that uh, if we were doing some real code review, this would be never passing. But uh, okay, I will be very, kind with myself and I will accept my change. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now it's time to submit this change. Uh, I'm using a, <coughs> a plugin that is called uh, the, um, the Git review plugin is, um, is, in a sense, is simple syntactic sugar. It just helps you to submit uh, uh, your, to commit your, uh, your change in, uh, in the format that Garrett wants. It's just a simple way to specify, uh, to not specify the refs uh, you're going to commit against, to, to push against. Uh, so this is uh, the command that I'm going. So what you see now, it, is actually that uh, Garrett is saying that uh, I just created a new change. This is my new change set uh, that I can browse uh, at this location. This is my very useful comment. Uh, and um, please ignore this part. This is something related to our implementation. And uh, this is uh, the repository I, I pushed against. So let's go on our uh, Garrett system. You will see that my change is here. It's ready to be reviewed. And uh, actually, the build has been quite fast, uh, so it already passed the verification phase, and it should be now running the inter integration test. So let's go on our, on our Jenkins box. Taking some time. Just in the meantime, while we're waiting just a refresh, uh, please notice that he has pushed to Garrett, but the commit is not yet in the target branch. So it's visible in Garrett in terms of open change. And even if he created a local branch, that branch is never going to be pushed to the server. So it doesn't pollute your history. But it's automatically converted into a Garrett topic. That is a much powerful concept, because a Garrett topic can spawn across different repos as well. So if you do just a feature branch, for instance, if you use Git flow, the problem is that the branch will be on a single repo. But if you use Git review, you do a local branch, you push to a topic. If you've got three repos with the same topic, you will be able to use it from Garrett as a unique entity. OK? It was just for waiting the refresh. Just to give some Yeah, yeah, we always do this when our servers are too slow, and um, that's why we talk a lot at work. But yeah, that's, um, so that's what actually is happening now. The integration tests are running. I will use also the execution time of the integration test to describe actually what's happening. And um, so one thing that I would like to mention is like, 
the process of creating the, the Docker instance is, is quite slow on the first execution. It, it becomes very fast uh, on the, uh, any subsequent execution. The kind of uh, like slow response time you're noticing now is mostly related to our infrastructure. I mean, this is something that we created in, in our own uh, environment, so something that we are maintaining. But um, this is quite fast. This is really quite fast. To have a CDH instance and Oracle instance is something that you can have running in a very like it's, it's, it's under a minute usually. Now, what's happening now, for example, it's actually, we are mostly waiting for the, um, the CDH and Spark to start up. So it's actually, this is the moment where our uh, Docker image has been created and all the service inside the, um, our CDH installation are starting up. We also didn't create uh, a specifically small uh, CDH. We installed all the service available, but we could have been even make the machine steamer. Okay, so let, let, let's go on the content. So what's happening in this moment is like we are checking out the code that uh, you might notice uh, at this point. We are loading the project definition. We are um, actually building the, the, the assembly. So actually we are building the jar that will be submitted to, for the integration test. And now we start doing the part that is more interesting for this presentation. So what we are doing is uh, we are creating containers. So we are creating a container that uh, is con actually running the Oracle, the Oracle DB. And then we are creating another container that contains the Cloudera installation and Spark. Uh, what's happening now is that we are, uh, well, I was talking before, we're waiting for the, the container to start up. And then we are initializing the DB with some test data. So we are, this is the command we are executing. So we are talking with this container. We simply say, please, load this SQL data and uh, create the table and create the data that we need. And uh, now we, this phase that you're seeing here is actually the submission of your jar against Spark. So this is actually a, a real execution on, on, uh, on a real cluster that's uh, just using these two boxes uh, against Spark. These are the log of the Spark job. And I think I talked enough to make the job complete. Yes, I think so, yeah. Um, so actually what's happening now is that the, the task generated is output and also is uh, error logs. And we are actually evaluating that everything is as expected. So this is very simple. We are just doing a comparison of files that we acquired from Hadoop or that we locally. So this is a, the simple flow. So this is something that executed for my commit. As Luca was saying, uh, this code is still uh, in a detached branch, so it's not touching, touching the ground. It is not affecting any build. In this case, it could have been, wasn't doing anything wrong, but actually uh, it's something that we still need to code review. As you might notice now, this change is, um, needs an update, is, uh, is updated. And uh, what you might notice now is actually that the, this change has been both verified and also integrated. So this is something that, uh, in, in, in our workflow, at least considering that we're working with this distributed team, it's, this is the phase where we want to start reviewing the code and understanding if this is, is actually something that we, we consider that is mature enough to be merged or we, maybe we want to do some changes. There is something that we don't consider <coughs> good enough or maybe there is some improvement that can be made. <coughs> and uh, let's imagine, in this case, I mean, I did the changes, so I trust my <coughs> good enough or and uh, I'm just deciding that I give a plus two. So actually, I consider this change good enough to be merged. And uh, I can proceed to merge. Once this is done, actually, uh, this is triggering, um, as I was saying, this is triggering the release candidate. So this change is going to be merged on master. And uh, it's going to be unit tested. And then it's going to pass the integration test. So now we have a. Uh, technically, we have a, a, new, <coughs> a new release candidate, and this is going to be deployed. Not in our case, but this is the kind of flow we are flowing. So I hope this is quite clear. This is kind, kind of a very simple flow. I'm just submitting something. Technically, a, a third person should evaluate it and uh, promote it uh, for uh, DRC. So once this is done, I can just uh, go back to my master. Check out the origin. Yep. Yeah. 
as you can see now, I'm just showing the, the Git history. Uh, the command that I showed before is just a specific way to have uh, some extra details from the, the Git log. So what you might notice is actually that uh, there is a new commit. This is the commit that we just did. That is the very simple change. <coughs> and you can see in the notes, uh, this is standard Git uh, installation. There's nothing special. Um, in the notes, you might notice that actually this is the full workflow of this change. This has been submitted in this part in, uh, at uh, 128, has been submitted by myself, and has been integrated, verified, and reviewed. So these are the kind of life cycle that this change had. This is, I mean, quite, if, you, if you're not a UI type, this is something that can be quite useful to use. And uh, as I was saying before, this is very easy. It's just a git log with some uh, special flag to show all the details. Cool. So let's, let's work on something that it's a bit more uh, convoluted, so we might need a, a bit as slow, a small kind of changes, a bit of interaction between the reviewer and the um, and the committer, so make, let's make the integration test fail. So what I can do, okay, cool. So I, I'm still insisting on this file just because it's very simple to make things fail if you touch the integration test, so failing. Okay, so let's commit this change and see what's happening. Okay, so now the change that uh, has been um, committed, that the new change here is, uh, is this here, this is the 15. Let's see if it's fast enough to go there. Yo, okay, so it's the 15. And uh, okay, still needs to be verified and integrated. So let's see what's happening. Okay, let's see. Okay, unit tests are running now. Yeah, it will be fast enough. So since now we have some time to spend, I can show you actually what's happening. In the, in the, the unit tests are really nothing special. It's just a simple build using SBT. For what is concerned the integration test, I think here we have some more comment, uh, content to, to watch. Them. So let's, let's have a look at what's inside here. Um, okay. Uh, this part is not really relevant. It's something we need uh, for the integration phase. Don't look this at is, the This is actually a feature that we discussed with Robert just earlier. So you will not, you will not need to put this part in real life. We'll need to make a, a patch to the Gary Trigger plugin to make this seamless, right? Just to create some pressure to the committer. And uh, so <clears throat> this part is simple uh, integration with Git. So actually we are uh, we're giving the coordinate of the Git repository. Uh, this actually, uh, this project is going to receive the rest pack from the previous step. So actually, we are building the same build that has been done by the unit test, and uh, is actually not triggered by any trigger if not the completion of the previous task. And uh, yeah, so we're building the assembly, as I was mentioning before. And actually, here, this is the part where actually we're starting creating the container. So we're creating two containers. This one is the, the Oracle one, and this is the CDH. Are we, we are just put adding the build number to the, uh, to the name to avoid conflicts if there are, or in this case, RRC, but if there are two parallel builds, obviously, we don't want anything to fail. And then this is the part where we start the containers. And uh, just if you're interested, there are some parameters that can be interesting. Here is the part in which you can specify that you want to wait for this container to start up. And you use uh, the, the fact that you're listening to some service to start listening to some port to verify if the state is uh, it's actually up. And uh, here is where we are mount mounting uh, some volumes using some lo local data directory. And this is used mostly to share the SQL script and some other data to the container. And the same happens for the CDH. Uh, and another important thing is actually that we're linking, as I was mentioning before in the, in the presentation, we are linking the Oracle box to the CDH box, and we are calling it Oracle GUC. And that will allow us to connect to Oracle using this, uh, this name and having our networking sold uh, simply. Uh, after this, we simply initialize the DB, as I was showing before. 
and this is the Docker exec. So we're just saying to Oracle, please execute this SQL script and initialize the data. And then we are submitting uh, on Spark. If somebody is familiar with Spark, it will just, okay, now this is the script. I can show you the content. It contains a Spark submit and, uh, and some checks about the com completion of the tasks. Okay, when everything is completed, we actually terminate uh, the, the two Docker container and everything is cleaned up. So let's go back, let's see. Okay, so yeah, almost there. Okay, they doubt they finish with a failure, so our test uh, just failed, as you might notice. Also the reason, actually, there is this line that uh, is making our integration uh, test failing. <coughs> if we go on uh, our Garrett uh, interface, you will see that uh, our change passed the verification phase, but failed on the integration phase. <coughs> So, I mean, uh, you know that the, the build is broken. Not, not the build is broken, but your change is broken. I, I, and, uh, okay, now I'm going to fix it and uh, try to, to solve the problem. So, actually, what I really wanted to do was to add another very meaningful line. This is my other extra line. And uh, I fixed the error that I did before. Yep. And now what I'm, I need to do, I need to amend my previous commit. So I'm actually uh, following the, the Git flow, the Garrett flow, in which uh, I'm actually fixing the, the problem I created before. And uh, this will be git commit minus minus amend. I'm able also to change the comment. It's like now it will work. Okay. And I submit a new review. So as you might notice, the, the, the change that has been uh, created is the same as before. So actually what's happening is that I simply updated the previous change. So if we go on this page, you will actually see that uh, the, the phases uh, are still, still uh, empty. So now the, the full pipeline uh, will restart again. We are in integration phase. And well, if you trust me, that will uh, complete. Uh, okay, if we can <laughs> go back to the slides, and now there is about seven minutes for a question and answers. So we'd like to know what do you think? And do you think it's useful? Or do you think it's trivial? And what those guys are presenting something trivial to me? Or maybe it's useless? And let us know because we'll be input for us. So, any question? So, the question was. How does it work when you've got topics distributed in different repositories? So what happens is that now this change was simple. It was on a single repo. But if you look at the changes here, so you've got in this branch, you don't just have the name of the branch. We've got something in brackets. Let's say failing integration. So it means if anyone else, not Stefano, but anyone else is going to use the same label, failing integration, the changes will be grouped together. So whenever you click on uh, the topic, this will show all the changes that are related. And what Garrett will do is basically to, uh, let's go down for instance. In this case, it's still running integration test, but to require that all the changes that are within the same topic in order to be mergeable, so in order to be submittable, will need to have all of them verify integrated and code review. So it's an additional constraint you give to Garrett by saying these things make sense, but only when it's merged all together. So imagine that you've got a second commit, the same topic, you will see that it will appear here. But even if he does code review on one, until you finish on the second, the button submit will not be enabled. And when the button is enabled, submit, all the changes that you see they are displayed here on the topic, will go on the repos altogether. Why this is important? It is important because if you're running, if you're running large infrastructures, I remember Robert a couple of years ago in the Jenkins conference was showing the Sony infrastructure. It was impressive, the number of slaves they got, the number of masters they got, the number of builds they're running every day. And imagine they've got maybe a topic that is spread across four different repos. And maybe a build on four different repos, they're gonna use a lot of resources. Just triggering the build when all the needed changes are committed at once is a huge value. 
And so far on the market, but even on the open source um, scenario, there are no other products other than Garrett that does that. And this is actually ab absolutely production ready. Google is using it for the Android operating system since April, and it works absolutely fine. And even Git protocol itself is going to include the multi-repository commit, just because of these needs. A lot of companies need that. And when the project gets bigger, you've got infrastructure services and then, let's say, silos of functionality. This is definitely needed. Imagine you've got a silos, they need a change on a framework. How do you commit the two changes together in order to make sure that you don't commit one if you don't commit the other as well? So Garrett, we had the concept of a topic. And again, a topic is not a feature branch. It's much more than that. It's a lot of feature branches and a lot of repos grouped together in a unique concept. Then you can achieve that. Yes, so uh, we used Mesos because it was the one that we have chosen in this project. But uh, actually, remember that Tiago was uh, put in different options, and OpenStack one, one was one of those. So it, it is definitely feasible. So the workflow we are showing is not that it just works in this way. But this is what we implemented for our clients. Uh, just one thing, so whatever we are seeing here is a real demo, it's not a fake demo. And whatever you're seeing here is really following the concept of this morning of the cattle, right? It means that if we kill all the machines now, Marathon will restart them again, and the demo will run again exactly in the same way. Whatever we are shown here, we're going to open from after the stock under the GitHub account associated to our company, Gary Forge. And if you want to apply the same concept for uh, your team as well, and you don't know where to start, you want to get something quickly, you want to replay exactly the things we've done, you just go and clone those repos, right? At this moment, they are private, but after the talk, they will be published as public. And if you want to improve them, because you say, listen, but you've used this feature in Garrett that doesn't really make sense, or maybe this plugin is not good, I want to use another plugin in Jenkins, you can do it. So even the Jenkins config is all stored in GitHub. It means that whatever config you have seen is all stored here. So whenever you will clone it, you will use it in your scenario, you will get exactly the same picture. So that is absolutely true. So when the people get uh, the Gary UI, they are impressed how ugly it is. And Jenkins. Sorry? Jenkins is great, right? Yeah, Jenkins <laughs> is a bit nicer because it's more color, right? So the maximum we managed to convince Sean Pierce, that is the author of Garrett, is just to change the colors. Because before it was an awful green. Yeah? And the justification was, Android is green. OK, yeah, makes sense. But can we make it a bit nicer, right? So uh, the answer is, uh, there is no plan from Google to make it nicer. But since version 2.7 of Garrett, and definitely this one is more advanced than 2.7, this is actually Garrett Master. And, this picture shows that we use the continuous delivery in Garrett for developing Garrett. Because I can take any cut of master, and our Docker container takes just the latest of master, and we do know that works. Because we apply the continuous delivery on our project as well. And uh, uh, this version includes RESTful API. So it means, first of all, if your company doesn't like the GUI and has bright, let's say, client developers, they want to develop a fantastic, I don't know, AngularJS GUI, they can definitely do it because RESTful API, they are absolutely documented and opened. Uh, I will promise you they will keep pushing Google to develop a nice UI. But I don't know why they just hire, let's say, backend guys. If you look at the Google tools, they're really primitive, but they work very well. So my suggestion is if you really see developers, they're really concerned about the GUI, just be positive by saying, why don't you write one? At the end of the day, the value is not the GUI. The value is the workflow. And if you don't want to see the GUI because it's ugly, there is a common line version of Garrett as well. Or you could use from IntelliJ. So as RESTful API are open, you don't have to leave your IDE. If you're using Eclipse, you can do the code review by Eclipse because there is a fantastic plugin that is very well integrated. It was developed by, I think, uh, Ericsson, one guy in Ericsson. And the IntelliJ plugin is fantastic for Garrett. So if you don't like the GUI, just close your eyes. Don't open that window, right? OK, I think we're running out of time. So thank you very much.
for your time today. And uh, if you want to catch up with us, we will just be outside here. And if you want to experiment the same demo yourself, but just wait a few seconds, then we just change the status on GitHub. You will be able to clone all the projects. Okay, thank you very much.